Okay. Awesome. Um, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about um, extravasation, what it is, and why we should care. Again, um, special thanks to uh, to Linda for for keeping this um, for for connecting me with with uh, Carrie around this topic. So extravasation is actually just a term for the leakage of any fluid outside of its container into the surrounding area. Um, the context that we're going to talk about it is actually with regard to um, uh, nuclear medicine and, and nuclear diagnostics. So I know that many of you um, have had pets and CTs. Um, if you have had pets and CTs with any radioactive isotopes, um, this is of particular uh, interest for, for you. So this is a slide that was that was provided to me. Um, and basically, not to read it to you, but when you go in for, we're going to use PET as an example, um, and you have the injection of the radioactive uh, isotope that is going to help reveal the places in your body where cancer um, may be active. 15.5% of the time, according to the, the data we have now, um, the injection doesn't make it clearly into the vein. Sometimes it splits the vein. And so it's not a situation where, you know, if, you, you, if they don't make the vein at all, there's kind of this subcutaneous um, bubble, right? You start to see the, the fluid build up under the skin. It's not like that. It's actually where they're kind of getting into the vein, but kind of missing the vein. And so not all of the radioactive isotopes are going um, into your vein, and some of them are kind of going in the surrounding tissue. Best estimates is this affects about half a million patients um, annually in the US alone. But the big thing here, and, and why we're talking about it is different than if this were to be um, a, a, a chemotherapy drug, a therapeutic. Um, this extravasation does not have to be reported. It doesn't have to be reported to you. It doesn't have to be reported to your physician, and it doesn't have to be reported to um, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which governs the use of um, radioactive everything. So if this individual in this, in this scenario then goes in for her scan, there is the potential that her results are not as clear and cleanish as, as they could be. For instance, there may be um, there may be instances of metastases where there wasn't enough of the radioactive isotope to actually concentrate in that area because half of it, you know, kind of went out into the surrounding tissue. Um, and so she doesn't get good scans. Um, all of this is, this is, the, this, is the, this is the big thing that we're worried about. Um, again, if chemo, if they miss a vein in chemo, um, one, you're, you're probably gonna know pretty quickly, but two, it has to be reported. Um, reporting is not required with, with, with radioactive isotopes um, for diagnostic purposes. Again, if, if you were to have a treatment with um, some sort of you know, nuclear medicine, this, that's different. It falls outside of, 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 this, um, of this space. So this is a, an image um, from the Federal Register. So there is um, a proposed rule being, being put up um, that these instances of, um, sorry, people are chatting and I can't read the chat and talk at the same time, um, that these instances of extravasation should be reported, not only to um, the physician, but also the patient and also the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, so we can start to better understand um, what the impacts are. Again, this is what I want to talk about, um, how we want to get involved, if you want to get involved, ways that we can get involved, but there's two issues. So if extravasation happens um, in, in the diagnostic process, your images, anybody's images may not be as accurate. That's, that's huge in and of itself. Also, because this is, under, this is not reported, it is therefore understudied. So sometimes these um, radiopharmaceutical extravasations um, can potentially be harmful to the tissue. And, and I'm not gonna read out all of the details because I don't actually know how to pronounce all of those um, SV things. I don't actually know what that means, but I can read that it exceeds the reporting limit um, in, under, under normal circumstances. 
So the ask here is that um, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission adopt the recommendations um, that, were, that were put forth in the, in the petition. Again, I'm not asking any of you to personally commit. Um, I am working with a, a woman who is trying to make this happen without a big campaign. I've actually um, suggested she connect with um, NCCS, but they're trying to do this by the beginning of June. Um, so if it doesn't happen by the beginning of June, then we'll look at maybe a, a bigger campaign. Stacy, so, who is initiating this? So let me stop sharing for a second. Can you guys see what I'm oh, please. Can you see what I'm sharing? No. I don't know why it just stopped with that and didn't stop. Okay. I'm not gonna be looking at you this way. I have to look at you here because now I've um, messed up my computer. Um, so there is an organization called RX for Good and the woman, um, her name is Carrie Lado. And I'm happy to connect you guys as individuals, but I also um, let her know that I would talk to this group um, in particular in a venue like this to gather any questions that you guys might have and gauge interest and figure out if we wanted to um, jump on board and support. So Linda, I do not want to put you on the spot, but I do know that um, she had reached out to you originally. So you're also well connected with, with some of these efforts if, if you want to talk a little bit about it or? Yeah, happy to. In fact, I feel a duty to inform here. I am not well connected to this. I, I kind of passed the buck. <laughs> but in all fairness, Pam Cole passed the buck yeah, to me. <laughs> I was going to say, I heard it from Pam Cole and yeah. had a meeting with that company that actually does. You that. did. Okay. So yes. that's what I want to jump in and say here that there is a company based in North Carolina, Patty. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so you can probably speak to it better, but I, I do want to emphasize there is a company that's got a product that can resolve this and that I'm not clear on the two um, entities, the company versus the Citizens for Good Rx or whatever you just said, um, Stacy. But Patty, do you want to say anything about yeah, so that, that was meeting? quite a few years ago. I don't remember. It was <laughs> it was a in-person meeting at a restaurant. So it was <laughs> Yeah. Uh, but yeah, there's a company and they've done some work um, at Duke, I think, um, kind of testing it. And what they can do is tell you in real time whether that was a good injection or not. Yes. Right. So, you know, it's and they were tracking how, you know, what are the um, so what causes a bad injection type of thing? Is it the administrator who's administering the, the thing or how fast or different things? So they ha actually had a lot of data. And I think it was really disconcerting, especially for patients and metastatic patients that rely on that PET scan every three months. And they do like comparative, right? And so, you know, um, you know, it gives you a false sense of security that everything's right all the time. You just assume everything's right all the time, but really everything might not be right all the time. And if there's a way that you can either train staff or monitor in real time, then why wouldn't you want to do it? Yeah, I do. I do want to clarify that um, this effort to push the NRC to require reporting is absolutely unrelated to any product. So this doesn't say this sounds very separate. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's very, very separate. So this would okay. just kind of be across the board. Now, where the it might get a little bit mushy is um, if somebody truly doesn't know, and so. Typically, and again, this is my understanding, and I'm happy to go back um, to Carrie and, and ask how it's done now, but typically you would know as, uh, as the radiologist because there would be a concentration of, of isotopes in the area of injection. If right. they look so for it. Based, based on... But your arm isn't in the, in the screening field. So again, from a pet standpoint, if, if you're getting a full body pet, Absolutely, you would know, but if, if you're not, if you're getting, you know, like a, a thoracic, you know, CT or something like that, you're right, you would not necessarily know. My well, arms are way above my head yeah. and the IV usually has, has gone in, not usually, they usually don't use the antecubital space for me. So my, so. my arms wouldn't even be in the... And I think, I think it totally depends on the imaging that you're getting and the way that it's done. I know that the, the, 
um, images that that they have within this organization to kind of push this forward are full body where you can actually see um, that there was a, an extravasation um, happening. But again, your, your point is valid. If, if that's not part of the picture, then they wouldn't actually be able to tell that way. So I'm not sure My, how they would tell. Not yeah, sure just looking. Yeah, yeah. As, a, I, I have as a, an MBC patient, my arms have never been in the scan. In the, in the Same <laughs> no. here. I can see and from I get the full, elbow up. Yeah, full body pets, but the arm is Same here. elevated. I have yeah. a question about this extravasation. What are the adverse events that occur other than just not having adequate imaging? What, I mean, are there... So is, that is was this the, like a yeah that was the that was the issue number two so these these extravagations can also irradiate tissue in the area of injection just in the area of injection then so it's it doesn't become a systemic thing I, I, I do not believe so but I can I can confirm with that one of the things that I did do and I'm just going to push this in the chat Janice so you could read this one of the things I did do um, was try to look up a lot of the, the papers, the you know, kind of studies related to it. And there's a couple of things going on here. First and foremost, because it's not reported, there's not a lot of research on it, right? And so in my mind, again, my opinion only, that until there is a requirement to report, we actually aren't going to really understand what the, you know, what the, the downstream effects are. We can, we can do, you know, case studies in, in, you know, kind of N of one um, situations, but we're not going to really have a, a, a strong understanding of, of, of the, the downsides. Now we do know that there are therapeutics that have radioactivity um, involvement and if there is extravasation with that administration that is required to be reported. And so there is data on what the negative effects. And again, from my limited reading, there's flushing, there's, and in some cases, there's actually a surgical intervention where you would go in and, and kind of take some of that tissue out. Oh, good grief. Thank you. I have a link to a published, I just looked on my email. That's why I'm looking the wrong way. Um, I finally um, <laughs> figured out how to change my screen. I'm, I'm rocking well, now. I, yeah, <laughs> but I, I like this screen rather than this screen. My camera is here, so but everything's over here because it's bigger. Um, so um, I actually have a link. Um, they sent a link to a case study. Um, Do you want to yeah. go ahead and put it in the chat? Yeah. So people can Let me do that. That would be a good idea. And I will send out, so I, one of the things that I, I think is most interesting is that this is the first time I've ever heard about this. Me too. Uh, yeah, when I heard about it, I was shocked. I think Pam fell off her chair, but anyhow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I mean, guess, Katrina was there as well, I think. And my, um, my question is, um, what is the downside? of requiring reporting. And in my mind, again, my mind only, the downside is it will take extra time, effort and energy on the part of um, radiology, you know, radiology and, and, and interventionists in, in that space and may put an extra burden on a physician in the sense of determining do we take this scan and and call it good and say yes this is indicative of of of, of what's going on in your body and we're going to design a treatment um, program around that or do we do another one and then now you've put an additional burden on the patient to say i have to do another scan again all this in the context of if if you're that person in the center and the whole point in getting a scan in the first place was to design an appropriate treatment protocol it's a pain in the ass, but I would imagine that the next, the new scan is probably what you're, what you're hoping for. Um, and again, if this is truly happening to half a million people every year, then we may need better methods of 
of, of, of doing this, whether it's a, you know, a, a different vein spot that might have a, a, you know, reduced possibility. I don't know. Better I, just... training, better training, um, things like that. And then um, also, I think this company had like advice. It was just a strip that went over the arm, right? Yeah. It wasn't it was simple... like invasive at all. No, yeah. it was a simple solution. Yeah. Can I just ask again, Stacy, how, how do we get to 500,000 a year if we're not reporting it? How do we know? I, that's the same question I asked her. So she and I are meeting tomorrow um, for me to come back with questions from this group for her. Um, and then for her to come back with some answers um, for, for me. Okay. Um, again, I think that there's this. <clears throat> in the company's name, I'll check that in there oh, as go well. I think is this the company that helps identify whether or not it's happened? I think so. Okay. Yeah, I, I I've got a dossier that a dossier that I probably can't share. <laughs> I think it's in there now. I'll look it up and see. If so, Linda, is. to answer your question, that that's one of my questions too. It's like, well, yeah. um, if it's not required to be reported, that said, there's a lot of things that aren't required to be reported to the patients that the you know hospital facilities know about. And so it may be talked about widely in, you know, radiology circles. It just doesn't have to be reported up to the regulatory commission or to um, a, a medical oncologist or patient. Yeah. But, I'm, but I, I really am looking at this and going, how many times have we, you know, talked to people who they, they thought they had, you know, no progression, they thought they were stable. And then three months later, it's like, you know, everything's on fire and you're like, did it really happen? I mean, maybe it happened in three months or maybe their last scan was not really a, a picture of what was going on. Again, just theorizing here. Right. Right. I do think it's something that patients are really not aware of, right? And physicians might not be aware of it. When they look at those scans, they might not know that you can ask, right? Right. I mean, we, Kelly and I were on a call with a representative from the company um, going back a couple of months and Kelly brilliantly said, you know, this isn't really an oncology issue. This is a radi radiology or, you know, whatever. I can't think of the name of the professional organization, but um, nuclear. nuclear med, you gotta, you gotta go that route. It's, yep. but pa patient advocates, I think, um, I don't, A, I don't think they know about it just like us and B, they would care a lot, so. And I'm gonna put in the, um, the link to the actual um, petition in the federal register. Okay. Um, they did have, and again, I, I you know, just found out about this kind of recently, but um, there was an open comment period that ended at the end of the year. And so it, it is closed in the, in the way that it has been formatted. Um, I read through it. I mean, if you've ever read things in the federal register, they tend to be a lot of legalese, but um, it's focused on reporting. So there's no, like nobody's talking about slapping people on the hands. Nobody's talking about any of that. They're just saying, if this happens, it needs to be reported to the, um, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which to me is, I'm like, well, duh, I, that sounds like it should be a good plan. But I am interested if you guys are like, no, Stacey, you haven't thought about this. I would love to. I'm just looking to see if I can find my notes. The, um, I'm thinking about the cost of that um, um, product. I, I know I wrote it down from that the company is moving forward on the name of Linda, the Linda, I have a question. This product, is it um, to identify where the veins are better or is it, um, uh, what kind it, of a product is it? It just detects <laughs> leakage. <laughs> yeah, oh, it, it just does. detects leakage. Yeah, so you yeah, put okay. it on your arm while the stuff is going in and it'll detect how much actually went in and how much did not. Okay, because I've had the, you know, where they scan and look at your veins to see, you know, I think it's some type of thermography or something that they use to, um, to identify where 
good access might be. I mean, how many of us have gone in for scans and had the worst um, technician (laughs) try to, you know, feel like a pincushion when we get out. And I think I see the benefit of this as um, just speaking from personal experience and, you know, after chemotherapy, my veins are, are horrific. Um, I see this as being a benefit also to the patients because if they do additional training uh, that's required, you know, for, for, um, you know, to administer whatever they're administering, whatever, whether it's a contrast, whether it's a radioactive isotope, whatever it is that they're administering, maybe they need additional training so that they can do a little bit better job. Yeah. I, Janice, I, I think you bring up a really good point too. Um, I've never, I've never had it used on me, but you know, the, the imaging where they could go and see where the veins are Mm -hmm. and maybe if, if reporting is required, obviously there's going to be more visibility and more attention paid to, to this. Um, And so maybe that becomes, you know, there's this Lucerna device that, that Patty put a, a link to, but maybe it's pre that maybe it's like, you know, everybody gets to um, get some support in finding a vein better. Right. I mean, it's, you know, and the, I I was just, um, I thought it was fascinating because I, I asked them to show me how it worked when I was at MD Anderson one time and they showed all the veins and she, and she pointed out, you know, well, this one, even though we can see it on here, really not a good access vein. This one, however, Mm -hmm. looks great. So it, it was, um, it was a tool that enabled them to better identify which vein to actually access. And this was just for a blood draw. So, you know, I think if we can get better trained techs, Mm -hmm. and if this leads to that, then you're going to have less of a chance of the extravagation, extravasation happening anyway. I, I, I that makes good sense. Just my opinion. Yeah. And I feel like if you give people feedback, like if they do track it and give people feedback, they do better. And I think they found that in some things. I think I remember them saying. So these talks that I had with Pam and Katrina and the company were in 2018. So, so it was a while ago. And I'm, I'm, I have no doubt that they are <laughs> definitely part of this initiative to require reporting because obviously that's gonna um, help make their product more viable. Um, but again, just, just from the, the patient perspective, I, I think that the, you know, having some sort of accountability, Linda, it, it is, um, Patty put a link, put a link oh, to sorry. The company. Yeah. no, 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 that's great. Yeah. Oh, got it. Okay. And she put a link to the actual website. Um, yeah. I, I can't find my notes from, from that call, but I know I wrote down the cost. I can keep looking. Um, I want to say it was like. $15,000 or something to what this product was. I mean, it wasn't inexpensive, but considering the upside, yeah. you know, and when you're spending that much on a pet, maybe I'm misstating it. It's maybe that's too high, but it's going to, it's all going to fall on our, you know, copay shoulders anyway. So what are they yeah. About? yeah. <laughs> sorry. Was that my outside voice? <laughs> but I still, I mean, as a patient, you know, just going through, I mean, my last pet was determinative for whether I was changing to my first chemo. You yep. have to have the good result, you yep. know? So yep. yeah. anyway, and I was once at a meeting that was, um, it was like pathology and radiology kind of like, and I'm like, patients just assume you're giving us the right answer. We don't question what you say. Well, and the, the like, thing that was really like, curious, and you're sitting there with all these indecision type of things. I'm like, oh my gosh, we, our whole treatment plan is based on that one piece of knowledge that you give us on what the and, subtype is. And it's is not and just about not having to tell the patient. It's, they don't have to tell the physician. They don't have yeah. to tell your treating oncologist. Yeah. yeah. And that's really where yeah. it just kind of, that's where it falls apart. Yeah. Yeah. Any other, so I have the, the, to take back tomorrow, the where, where exactly did we get the half a million um, data from? Because mm-hmm. I think that's a, that's a fair question. Um, 
and I will actually encourage her to add uh, some references in that in that visual um, image as you know too. But are there any other big questions around? Well, and Dana and Meredith, I see that you've joined, and I don't know when you joined, um, but you know, feel free. We're we're basically talking about the fact that um, if you have um, uh, radiological injections for diagnostic purposes, so for, like for a PET or for a CT, and it all doesn't make it into your vein, it's called an extravasation, and that extravasation can compromise the legitimacy, the accuracy of the, the imaging that then takes place. Um, and so what we're talking about is a push, a petition to require any extravasations to be reported to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Um, and then, you know, cascading from that would be um, notification to physician and patient so that the right decisions can be made. Thank you so much for that. I joined about 15 minutes in. Um, and I have my camera off because I have some people going back and forth behind me. So because you didn't want us to be jealous about your outside view. It is beautiful, but you know what? You can hear the cicadas here. Um, they're, they're humming away. <laughs> and then the yard, like way behind me there, they're having some tree work done. And occasionally you see this guy just go zoop. So I didn't want that to be distracting, but anyway, thank Welcome. you for that. I think that's really important. I um, have the smallest veins on the planet, so have had some issues. So I think it's a good topic to, to discuss. Awesome. I joined about 10 minutes ago. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, the worst, absolute worst, um, you know, phlebotomy has been in, the, in radiology. And I have given that feedback, never heard back from anyone. And... Uh -huh. You know, I mean, it's just, yeah, not okay. And, you know, the radiology, at least in my experience, places I've been, you know, radiology feels like that's not their main job, you know, and several times I asked if they could just get someone from the lab to come, <laughs> you know, who's <laughs> more expert. And uh, they like looked at me like I was insane and did not do that, you know, but it's just been really difficult. I, I do the same thing, Meredith. I, that's the first thing I say when I go in, I say, are you the best? Are you the best? <laughs> and they, of course they always say yes. And I say, well, if you're not the best, then you need to go get the best because I don't feel like being stuck a million times today. And, you know, sometimes it's an ego thing for them, but I also have had the worst experiences uh, that were, you know, in, in some type of radiological imaging study, always the worst. Yeah, I had one time where um, she couldn't get it, didn't get into my vein at all. So she went out, got some washcloths and um, ran them under some tepid water and put them on my arm and they were like dripping all over my clothes. And I'm like, what is going on here? This is not okay, you know? <laughs> and then she went and got somebody else, but. So always ask for the pediatric phlebotomist. Because oh, man, yes. those people I actually have done that because I have True. very tiny I have very tiny veins. And so um I learned quite a few years ago that I just didn't let anybody stick me. And so they have to use the pediatric needles in order to even give me transfusions or anything else. And I can remember when I was in the hospital for my mastectomy, I had and they told me don't let anybody stick you on your left side, the side that you had the mastectomy on. Mm -hmm. And this, this big old nurse, I mean, he was really big, had big hands. And he, was, he said, well, you've got too much stuff going on on the right side. So I'm going to have to take it from the left side. I said, no, you're not. I said, check my chart. You are not to do anything on my left side. And he was adamant. And so I kicked him in the balls. Oh, oh no. <laughs> Over now. Over <laughs> now. That surprised me. Good for you. <laughs> And, and they called and, and, and I told him, I said, have him call my doctor. And my doctor uh, told him, he said, he said, he's usually not that, he said, he's usually a nice gentle giant. I said, he wasn't that night. And I said, he was oh. in the middle of the night. And I was, I, I had enough sense to know that he wasn't supposed to stick me on the left side. Oh, so. man. <laughs> but I, you know, that's, I've had that problem where, you know, I've gone into nuclear medicine for, you know, imaging and they've given me a contrast. And um, 
the fact is, is that they didn't get, get a good vein the first time and they kept trying. I said, look, I'm done. If you don't do it in three times, out of here. And I just, I'm just very adamant about it. If you can't, it's it hard. Out, I, you know, we're, we're also helping to make decisions for people who don't have, uh, who don't feel like they can have a strong voice. Um, you know, and again, I think most of us on this call have, have figured out how to use our outside voice in healthcare. Mm -hmm. um, but Renelle, you bring up a great point. It's, you know, if, if, if we feel comfortable, you know, saying that does not mean that the, the next person um, who's going to come into that room after us does. So in, in many ways, I, I feel like this kind of has fallen into our laps and, and it's a decision that will have um, kind of long standing and far reaching um, impact. In, well, in the it's patient an inconvenience community. for the patient, you know, yeah. and uh, that's where my voice comes from. It's an inconvenience, you know, yeah. I, I don't have to be a pin cushion for you all day to figure out where that vein is, you know, yeah. and if you can't figure it out, then I'm out and yeah. I'll come back another day when someone else is more uh, professional and can do it. Uh, but yeah. I'm not going to stay there all day and let them, you know, keep poking at me. Here, here. So, so glad Linda I just put a, a text <laughs> or a chat. Um, the device is called the LoRa system. Again, to clarify, we are not in any way, shape, or form advocating for a device. We're not advocating for, uh, you know, improved training. And we're not advocating for any of that. All we're potentially doing is adding our voice and our support to the existing petition that asked the National Regulatory Commission to require reporting of extravasations in the um, radiological uh, diagnostic space. Again, if it's a treatment, it is already being reported. That is, that is a done deal. So this is not, you know, people, a lot of times now um, individuals will receive uh, uh, radioactive treatments, right, for cancer, for other things. This is any, um, radiological for diagnostic purposes, which, which falls outside of the, the current reporting requirements. Again, any more questions um, that I can bring up and, and get answers? I have a, I have a general question. <clears throat> Being new to this group, um, this seems like a uh, specific issue that um, you're then trying to say, how do we uh, advocate for doing something about this. And part of that you mentioned at the beginning might be through coalition forming or finding other groups that would also be aligned. I see the Personalized Medicine Coalition does this. They get like, can I get half a dozen or a dozen co-signers to something we're putting in front of the federal government or something like that. Yeah. And you mentioned NCCS. I'm very curious about NCCS. I'm not a, not a member, sort of aware. Um, but what about, what about NCCS and what about other collaborators or partners in, in forwarding something like this? Yeah, so great, great, great question, Brad. Um, there, is, there is an organization, so this Rx for Good is already kind of taking the lead in forming um, a coalition. So the people who have signed on already, um, uh, ICANN, Stupid Cancer, uh, Research Advocacy Network, um, Young Survival Coalition, the Pink Fund, They've, they've already started kind of building this coalition. And I think what we know as, as advocates who are affiliated with a lot of these you know, different, different things are there's the, the big letter and then there's the individual efforts. Um, and so many of the people on this call are also affiliated with other organizations. So we can actually potentially bring other organizations into to the coalition that they're forming. NCCS, um, and and we'll, we should probably have a, a whole session dedicated to them, but it's the National Coalition for Cancer Survivorship. Um, so Shelley fold Nalso is the um, executive director or CEO. I don't remember what their structure looks like. Um, and they help make policy very easy for advocates. Um, so they will, they will help um, they will listen to what the needs of the patient and, and survivor community are, and they will start to build, um, you know, bills and, and, and start to get behind things. So they'll, they'll actually do all of the heavy lifting that 
sometimes that's very hard for us as individuals to do. And then they bring us on board to say, hey, this is the issue. Um, this is the benefit. This is the risk. These are the people who have sponsored this bill. Um, and then they teach individuals how to advocate um, within their own districts, within their own states, within their own. But, but they, they actually do, in my estimation, they do the bulk of cancer policy work. Um, so again, I've, I've suggested that this organization bring Shelly and team in because it's an incredibly powerful group. Um, I've also suggested that, you know, she can probably find a lot of support in the American College of Radiology, like legitimately through, through some of the oncology leadership there. So, um, but, but yes, great point. And, and definitely, I think the ethos that we all support is that we're, you know, we, we move mountains together and, and separately, we just kind of kick at the dirt, so. Thanks, thanks, that was useful context. Anybody else um, have any questions? <laughs> Janice had to leave, she's like, I'm on board. So Stacy, um, I'm looking back at an email from the company representative. Sorry to keep going back to the company, but that's okay. That's Ron, okay. Um, Ron Latanz is his name, and he was proposing an action item um, that he would draft a proposed sign-on letter for organizations and um, perhaps this collaborative to consider submitting to the NRC. So I never saw that, but maybe he started it, maybe he's begun that work, so. So there is, a, there is a sign-on letter um, that exists right now. And again, it, it, it makes no mention of, um, it makes no mention of any product. It's just- Solution, yeah. It, it just says that, you know, this is a critically important issue um, and, you know, we support uh, all of the recommendations included in the petition. Okay. Um, that's, that's already been published. Okay. And Linda, I'm happy. I mean, I, I definitely want to make sure, I mean, one, I want this group to know that these are potentially very separate things, like the, the, the company support for it. And at, at the same time, it will benefit a company, right. That can, that can help make this process easier to detect. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, just more, more importantly, I just want to make sure that if people have questions about what we're, what the petition on the table is, um, if they, if there are any perceived like, no, nah, this could be a bad idea because again, I don't see any of that. I, I don't see how awareness of, of, you know, a, a procedure gone a little sideways is, is a bad thing. Um, but if there are those, I, I want them to, to come up today. Yeah. One other thing I'll add on here. Um, so I remembered the 15,000 it's, but it's 15,000 for the hospital system or, or, you know, uh, the imaging site to buy the system. And then these are like mm -hmm. test strips kind of that go on the arm. Right. And so each individual patient would experience a test strip cost of 10 to $15 probably will bill out higher from the hospital system like that won't be the patient that's the that's the um the actual cost but the build cost would have you know cost sharing on top of it yeah. he likened it to glucose test monitoring strips he said the the actual cost if you're getting a glucose test strip in the hospital is ten dollars but you're going to be billed a hundred dollars nevertheless it is very it's it's low cost high impact potentially so I don't have any problem supporting that. I just didn't have the bandwidth to join on when I talked to this guy. Um, yeah, no, no ago. worries at all. And again, we are not like, you know, they, they know in, in some situations that this, this extravasation is happening. Mm -hmm. So they knew before this company existed. So what we're kind of pushing for potentially is just require reporting. And yep. then at the hospital level, you. If you want to get help with that by being able to detect it more easily, um, I like to to you know some of your points about helping to train your your people a little bit better so it doesn't happen as often. That's great. Um, 
If they're tracking chemotherapy extravasations, how are they detecting them? Is that just visually? Because it burns the shit out of your, sorry, it burns okay. you. Okay. Um, it's, you know, you're putting caustic materials and you're putting them subcutaneously and it's a, it's a pretty instantaneous thing. In fact, I think, Sandy, did you, did you have an extravasation? Did you have a, an issue with adriamycin a long time ago? Were you talking to me? I was. I was. Uh, yes, I have had that problem several times because of small vein yep. and uh, only using one arm. Yep. So I've had to, in different instances for imaging, they've had to go into my leg and use one of my leg things mm. rather yeah. than my arm. Were you, I think, I thought it was you, maybe it was somebody else that you actually had um, the extravasation, the, the leakage of, of adriamycin into your, um, into your oh, tissue. Yeah. 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 And so you, yeah. So that's, yeah. that's what it looks like. Um, yeah. it's a, so it's like burned from the inside out. Yep. Yeah. And so this is, I mean, so part of the, re the reason that's required reporting is because, well, everybody's going to know the second it happens. Yeah. Um, whereas with some of these, um, materials, it, it, it's not as easily um, determined. Yeah. I think it's good to support uh, about the reporting. So you know what it is. So there might be more companies looking at this and looking at alternatives, more hospitals looking at solutions and, you know, administration and things like that. It would just kind of increase the awareness of something to do. And that there is a company that has a an alternative uh, thing kind of makes you more motivated. It doesn't change what you're supporting, but you have that kind of jewel of knowledge in your cap yeah. that no, this isn't gonna cost you an arm and a leg and it's not gonna cost patients an arm and a leg and it's actually gonna be a high benefit for patients in the end um, type of thing. Cause you gave a lot of you know roadblocks like, well, why would we do this? It would cost blah, blah, blah or something. Yeah. It's like, no, no. That's not a that's not an acceptable answer because we actually know of things, right? So, so I think um, what what I'm going to do is I'm going to take back the, the the one question I have. Um, I'm, I'm talking again with Kiri tomorrow, and then um, I will send a, a, an email complete with like attachments around. Um, she's got some social media for those of you who are on Twitter or Facebook or whatever. Um, and the reason that's important is because she's also identified a lot of the um, legislators that are um, targets for, for supporting this bill. I don't imagine, I haven't heard really any resistance to it, but it, at the same time, there's a lot of things that come up in front of legislators' desks. And if they don't know about it, they might just not pay attention to it. So we all do, you know, a lot of us know through our efforts with NCCS that, um, you know, we, we do have a lot of pull with, with um, the legislative community. Yeah, there's a link to something for David for, for Price, which is probably David Price in North Carolina. So <laughs> one of the links on the side. <laughs> oh, Meredith, that's such a great idea. So Meredith just said that um, it required reporting as a great way to go with this. It would be great if this was also a requirement for Commission on Cancer Accreditation. So a, an NCI, um, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a great, great point. So. Yeah. All right, I am going to 